the memory of plants, genetics, migration, and the construction of the future. I wanted to start with this quote by Emanuele Cocha, the little green limbs that populate the planet and capture the energy of the sun are the cosmic connective tissue that has allowed for millions of years the most disparate lives to cross paths and mix without melting reciprocally one into the other. That's from the life of plants and metaphysics of the future. I want to thank Kira Ennis for inviting me to participate in this panel, as well as to speak with all of you today. I'm very fortunate to share this space with Karen and Jenny, and I am very happy to be here at Art Center participating in this symposium and speaking about my work and my research related to post-human imaginaries and eugenics in Pasadena, a place that is at the heart of these histories. Thank you. <laughs> thank, um, thank you all for being here. In general terms, my work explores the memory of growing up during the Civil War in El Salvador and my experiences of migration as, a, as I moved first to Arizona, where I lived for almost 11 years, before moving to Los Angeles in 2000 via Detroit. But my work is also about the experience of simultaneity, being in multiple time frames, living in two places at once, San Salvador and Los Angeles, existing in two or more, but different versions of modernity in different cultural worldviews, moving back and forth within different technologies. And more importantly, my work is about the future. I build memories so I can imagine possible futures. Because of this, there are three concepts that are central to my work, time, simultaneity, and movement. And I am interested in how issues such as race, class, migration, and gender cut through these concepts. The environment has been an important source of metaphors for me, even when I work with industrial steel, It is with the intent of returning this industrial material that has been artificially extracted from the earth back to the land. Building rocks with steel is an example of that gesture. However, it is through my work with plants that I have understood that our mark on this planet is not only written on the sedimentation layers on, or on the rock, but also on the living environment. After all, a garden is an artificial arrangement of plants a form of human intervention with cultural and historical content. Plants have allowed me to build metaphors about eugenics, about labor, migration, hybridity, ancient knowledge, and others. In order to move through space and time and to explore simultaneities, the ability to intervene in the chronological order of time is central to my work. One of the thinkers who questions the way modernity imposes a chronology and a universal narrative of time is Peter Osborne. He argues that the effort to establish a narrative about modernity towards progress, towards development, is also a colonial and homogenizing effort to erase diversity. Rather than a chronology, Osborne is interested in exploring different modernities that coexist simultaneously. Also, Certain ideas about speculative realism, the post-human, philosophies of extinction, invited me to question the imposition of humanism, liberalism, or the enlightenment as the only way, a colonial way, to understand reason, and with it, to understand time. Instead, I became interested in circular, often times indigenous conceptual constructions of time, multiplicity, and simultaneity. Death as a way of becoming an extinction as an imaginary began to populate my mind as I read about the non-human and about a future after humans, particularly through the work of Claire Colebrook. She invites us to imagine a non-human geologist of the future reading our mark on the planet, the sedimentation layers, the rocks, and the stones for traces of the Anthropocene for traces of human life on the planet. But its job will not be easy, I imagined, and lava came to my mind as a material that would confuse the geologists of the future and would blur the records, mm -hmm. but more importantly, would break with the chronological order of time. That the lava from the past 
spit out by a volcano, there are always volcanoes in the landscapes that I imagine, would change the order of the layers that write the temporal history of our passing through the Earth. And this is how I began to explore different ways in which matter breaks chronology. I built Cairn, which is this image that you see, and also this one, out first outside the Brand Library in Glendale and later inside Rafa Spartas' figure ground beyond the white field at the 2017 Whitney Biennial. It was a mound of stone serving as a landmark. Indigenous peoples have built cairns for centuries to mark the way on a trail, to mark sacred or burial ground, or to um, mark a mark land in other ways. Within modernity, a cairn is often used to deline delineate or imagine a line as permanent, the line that, uh, um, that marks private property or that traces the border between two nations. But indigenous peoples did not build cairns with a binding element such as stucco or cement or glue, an improvised structure for them that could come apart and could come together again at any point. Later on, I built a similar piece with rocks that could potentially be from the Ice Age, that's the one that you saw just before, and had been dragged by the rivers generated by the melting ice in an area of Wisconsin called Kettle Moraine. As I thought about materials, plants became part of my language. Okay, I'm stuck here, but I'm gonna keep reading. Maybe we'll start moving. Um, and an important medium for me, for instance, they were the symbol of the tropics and of the passage of time in my video installation called Childhood Bedroom. Soon, they took on a central role in my work, as I will explain in a moment. In her book, The Death of the Posthuman, Essays on Extinction, Australian philosopher Claire Colbrook argues that human beings are the authors of our own extinction due to our own desire to eat fats and sugars and to our own overconsumption, and also of the destruction of the environment that we need in order to exist. For Colbrook, it is important to think of the possibility that humans are about to disappear and that the era of the human, the Anthropocene, is about to end. So for Colbrook, it is important to think of the possibility that humans are about to disappear and that the human era, the Anthropocene, is about to end. Nevertheless, she reminds us that human beings are not necessary for the planet's existence or for the world to continue. Other, other eras without us have preceded us and other eras without us will follow. In terms of the time that the planet has existed, we have been but a brief lapse in its history. It is from this perspective that I'm interested in thinking that humans are not necessary for memory to exist. That it is possible to think of a post-human memory or a non-human memory, for instance, the memory contained in lava or the memory of plants. As she imagines a non-human world, Colbrook's reflections center on vision through the human eye. She defines the eye conceptually as the organ that organizes the world, a synthesizer, she calls it, that reads, theorizes, and systematizes everything it sees. And she says that the human eye, I'm sorry, that the human animal or human eye is torn between spectacle or captivation by the mere present and speculation ranging beyond the present at the cost of its own life, she says. On the one hand, this eye that synthesizes and digests the world is corporeal and through seeing reproduces our humanity. Her perspective on the human eye shows what it sees but also the human body that contains it much in accordance with the way in which Judith Butler argues that a photographer, even if not visible within the frame of a photograph, is always present in the image. Thus, vision runs the risk of reconstituting humanism. 
In her conversation with Bergson, Holbrook reminds us that the human eye, she says, organizes the world into conceptualized units, mastering the world by reducing difference. The eye takes what it sees, pays attention to some details, produces some images with sharp detail, and organizes and digests what it sees into a world that is coherent and unified, a world without differences, a human world. From this perspective, the eye that sees is the one that constitutes the human subject. But on the other hand, Colbrook says, another way to deal with the eye is to think of the eye as a machine, engaging the world as Deleuze. She wonders if it's possible for non-human perception to exist, if it's possible to imagine a world without us, not the world as our environment or our surroundings, but a world that would open us up to the inhuman and superhuman durations to go beyond the human condition. In this sense, the non-human eye, the machine eye, could edit in more difference, could potentially see other detail and other diversities that the human eye does not see. It could complicate things and see beyond the human limits. For instance, a selfie would be a perspective for excellence within the diagrams of humanism, but by contrast, the image generated by the x-rays that our dentist takes or the landscape projected by the camera during a colonoscopy mm -hmm. exemplify the vision of a machine eye. And so, Colbrook imagines a machine eye that exists when humans have ceased to exist on the planet. It is an eye that reads the sediments that humans have left without their time I mean, through their time on the planet, the remains of the Anthropocene, what she calls the scars of the strata of the Earth that mark human life. This machine eye will move through the Earth as a researcher moves today through an archive, as an archaeologist moves through a site, and will read the world, its anthropo anthropologic scars, its survival in spite of human existence on its surface. Colbrook imagines this machine eye as a geologist of the future. This non-human geologist of the future will detect other rhythms, will take different points of view about what has been recorded on the earth. This geologist of the future will read our present at a moment when it will have become part of the past. This world will not be seen from a human eye will not be seen from a human body. It will not be a world for a body. It will be an impersonal image. She invites us to think about extinction and the possibility of abandoning subjectivity as we have understood it through the lens of humanism. In the theory of the disappearing future, Colbrook addresses the construction, not from a tradition linked with the Rida, which after all reconstitutes subjectivity and context, and by doing so, reinstitutionalizes the diagram of the identity practices inscribed on the subject within the humanist philosophical tradition. That is, the Rida's deconstruction moves towards the past. On the contrary, Colbrook is interested in understanding deconstruction as future-oriented, understood from a perspective that is closer to the teachings of the man and his insistence that we approach culture, images, texts, and landscape as if it were detached from all humanity, as if, to, to use the loose and, and Gattari's terms, it was without a people, as though the population were still missing. In other words, to approach everything as if the humans that were meant to perceive it had not been born yet. That is, to approach everything as if it were part of the future, especially a non-human future that would allow us to imagine a different, a new form of vision. Rather than restoring everything to its original intention, which would be equal to assigning it a fixed identity, this would give new life to a text or an image each time we approached it. It would open possibilities for becoming when facing each text, each work of art, always towards the future. It is with this process in mind that I would like to approach the knowledge and the wisdom embedded within plants. This is the work of Brazilian artist Maria Teresa Alves. It has impacted my reflections about the memory of plants, the post-human life of plants, and the non-human possibilities held in plants. Alves's project titled The Seeds of Change installed at the 
port in different European cities, including Bristol, Marseille, and Liverpool, invites the viewer to reflect upon the legacy of colonialism through the displacement of plants through their seeds traveling as part of ballast or disposable materials that were discarded by the ships upon their return from the Americas and other locations where they took humans to be sold and enslaved. Life in the dormant seeds remained latent for centuries, and the artist turned gardener was able to germinate them once again in order to create beautiful gardens from their social, um, displaced from their social political histories, ancient indigenous plants growing in European port towns, a visible remnants of slavery. It was in part due to these reflections about Maria Teresa Alves's work that I began to think about the memory of plants in the context of Central American migration, about the plants preserved, how the plants preserved the memory of a migratory experience that followed a very similar trajectory to my own. After the publication of The Life of Plants by Emanuele Cocha, I began to think also about how plants are the lungs through which an atmosphere emerged, what he called the essence of cosmic fluidity. From his perspective, plants were the we're generating an atmosphere that is the infinite mixture of all things past, present, and future. And to breathe, then, is to embrace in one's own breath all the matter of the world. For Kocha, plants' leaves are a climatic laboratory that produces and frees it into space the elements that render possible life the presence and the mixture of an infinite variety of subjects, bodies, histories, and worldly beings. But it also meant, I'm going to try to summarize because I think I'm out of time. Um, so I can skip, I can stop here. So I don't know. <laughs> I couldn't go on without my presentation, sorry. I'm going to go super fast. OK. <laughs> so um, these are some images that are relate to eugenics in Pasadena. So I, want to make sure to mention them quickly. It was especially in the archives that the history of migrating plants impacted me profoundly, especially when I realized that it was linked, linking um, colonialism, deep racism, white supremacy, and a, a name called my attention, Popeno. In, I had been to the Casa Popeno that you see here in Antigua, Guatemala, several times. And it was the house of Wilson Popeno, the director of, for over 25 years of the Pan American School of Agriculture, also known as El Zamorano, established by the United Fruit Company in Honduras. It was the, in these archives in Los Angeles that I realized that Popeno, this last name, not only evoked the Zamorano or the United Fruit Company, but also this history of racism and eugenics that united different parts of my life, the, the, the imperialistic um, extraction of uh, natural resources from Latin America and the hatred towards immigrants here in the United States. It was an organization that advocated for the forced sterilization of African Americans, Latinos, and indigenous peoples, as well as migrants, the ill, the poor. It also evoked a history of colonialism, since both Paul and Wilson Popeno had participated in a program of agricultural explorers that was fostered by the Department of Agriculture, the Ministry of Agriculture in 18. 98 established this program, and soon um, people like Wilson and Paul Popeno were in places like Bolivia and the Middle East looking for things like dates and avocados and um, oranges, and here we see some images of that in Coachella, etc. And afterwards, Wilson Popeno de de dedicated himself to genetic experimentation of bananas in, the, in Honduras and in Central America, while Paul Popeno dedicated himself to experimenting with humans, contributing to the sterilization of a great number of people in California. Their work through the Human Betterment Foundation sparked great interest in Germany during the 1930s and, allowed, and was allowed to continue in California until the late 70s. However, when World War II ended and eugenics declined in popularity, Paul Popeno devoted himself 
to expanding his eugenics project to phase two, establishing the first marriage counseling program in the United States, and uh, trying to promote marriage and procreation of superior couples. This is the location of their clinic on Sunset and Western. He created the National Family Defense Fund in Hollywood, began publishing a series of columns in the newspaper, as well as in the Ladies' Home Journal. He had a column for 25 years titled, Can This Marriage Be Saved? With the support of Hollywood, he became a radio and TV personality in divorce court and divorce uh, hearing. So these ideas about the memory of plants have nourished my art practice. I created Nomad 13 with Rafa Esparza as a sculpture that um, has the shape of a space capsule, a cosmic garden that preserves the knowledge and culture of ancient indigenous peoples in the Americas and imagines it as part of the future, and particularly the memory insertion capsule, a steel structure that takes on the form of a space capsule but brings together indigenous forms of architecture, Spanish colonial design, craftsman architecture, industrialization, and precarious tent living, evoking in this way multicultural coexistence in the city of Los Angeles, as well as the shape of a Mayan pyramid and celebrates the Mayan glyph of zero, the machine eye that allows the viewer to see fragments of the archives that I found at Caltech about eugenics. And um, I think I'm going to leave it there and we can continue talking during the conversation because I want to make sure to hear my colleagues. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna run through these slides and thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.